All right, look, I know that 90s comics get a bad rap. I know that. But I'm here to tell you that their reputation is ill-deserved. Sure, there were a number of really terrible books that were put out there in the 90s. I mean, for a couple of years there, it seemed that much of what was on the shelf was all style over substance. And the style, in many cases, well, let's just say that style is subjective. Regardless, despite the number of horrifically bad comics that lined the shelves in the 90s, there were a crap ton of great comics out there as well. Take The Heckler, for example. I apologize for that, but I think you'll find this a bit more interesting. Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Just Another Fanboy, the best thing to happen to podcasting since a couple of guys in Pennsylvania decided to get together and talk about comics. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and this is the first of the last five episodes of season six. And I just want to get you all prepared for June because there ain't going to be no just another fanboy in June, folks. Or will there be? Will there be there? Or will there be there? Doesn't sound right. Or will there be there be? I feel like I'm extending it. A little too much. Or will there? That that sounds about right. Look, the original plan, I talked about it last week, was that I was going to stay away from just another fanboy in June. Was going to put out nothing. In fact, I think what I said last week is that normally I like to put out bonus episodes. That I, I get nervous just thinking of the fact that there's going to be an entire month without any episodes landing and dropping and all that stuff. And and that makes me nervous. It makes me itch way back in the backs of my teeth. And so I end up cobbling stuff together just to have some content out there for y'all. And I I told myself that this time was going to be different. I was not going to do anything. I was going to stay away because I had other things to focus on. And if y'all needed to hear my silky smooth, why is it always silky smooth? It's more of a uh, I don't know what a chocolate river. I was going to say chocolate river, but that's not quite right either. Jelly donut like voice. I think that's more like the, the insides of a jelly donut. That's, that's kind of what my voice sounds like. Anyway, if you, if you feel like you need to hear that in June, there are other podcasts of mine that you can listen to. I would direct you to my other podcast, which is called my other podcast. I would direct you to the, the Superman super show and and even event or else, which I hope to have at least one or two episodes out in June. But I came up with an idea today, and uh, I put that idea in motion. And, uh, well, let's just say that there will be episodes in June. But let's also say that uh, I will not be recording any episodes in June. Let's just leave it at that. I don't know if I will let the cat out of the bag. I probably should because it's not good to keep a cat in a bag. That seems kind of mean. I think what I'm trying to say here is I don't know if I want to tell you what I have planned. I don't know if I want to just surprise you or maybe as we get closer, give you an idea of what's going on. But for now, I'm just going to, I'm going to say nothing at all and uh, just leave you with a little bit of mystery. And yeah, with all of that, out of the way now, now that I've done all that and given you really nothing, just wasted your time there. We really need to get into the subject at hand, which is the heckler from DC Comics. But before we do, how about we do a little bit of listeners feedback? So if you remember Last week, I unveiled the new 
just another fanboy voice line, which I, I shortened. It's actually called the just another voice line. And you can use it to text or call. I said that kind of weird, didn't I? You can use that to text or call at. You can use that to text or call and leave a voicemail at 785 318 6673. That number will be in the show notes. I let everybody know all about that last week. And lo and behold, I got a text. Our very first text, it comes from Eric, who is the host of the Long Box Review podcast, one of my favorite podcasts out there. And he says, Stephen, welcome back to the voicemail text space. Obviously, I listened to your latest episode. Your thoughts about being a reader versus collector hit home with me as well, but I'm not quite there yet. I appreciated your thoughts about Adams and Perez. We seem to have similar experiences with their work. Looking forward to watching the Perez video. And again, that's from Eric from the Longbox Review podcast. You can find that at longboxreview.com. I recommend that to all y'all. If you like a single hood pop, if you like a single host podcast, and of course you do, because you're listening to mine, and mine's a single host podcast, then you'll like Eric's. Eric's is, is somewhat similar to mine, in which we both talk about older books. Um, we, we both read newer books, but uh, a lot of the, uh, the books we talk about on our shows are, are older books. You know, he's pulling them out of his long box. I'm not sure why I said it that way. I, I'm going to warn you guys right now. I don't know how far we into this. We see, I keep doing, it. <laughs> I don't know how far we are into this podcast. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm having a lot of trouble speaking today, folks. It's been a very strange last few days, it's been very stressful and chaotic and twirly. And, uh, my mind right now is kind of racing like Speed Racer or Racer X or an E-Racer, except for that tends to go backwards and delete stuff. But my mind is just moving super fast and my mouth has never been able to keep up with my brain. And you know that that's what's going on when I just suddenly have these very weird ways of speaking. Just I just suddenly just combine words and uh then make funny noises in my embarrassment. But anyway, uh, as I was saying, the Long Box Review Podcast, I would recommend it to you because, um, you know, it's it's like, think about it like this. It's like listening to just another fanboy, except for Eric knows what he's talking about. So if, if you know, if you listen to me and you go, you know what, gosh, that Stephen sure is entertaining, but as much as I love his show and, and as much as I know that I will listen to every single freaking episode that Steven ever puts out and I will never leave him and will be loyal till the bitter end and stand in front of a bullet for him and wrestle a rhinoceros to the ground and, and all kinds of crazy things like that. There are times when I want to listen to a show like Steven's, but if only the host knew what they were talking about. Well, there you go. Long box review. Get over there and listen to that show. And he says there in his text, I'm looking forward to watching the George Perez video. And <laughs> Eric, I have to say, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it too. I, I, I kind of, uh, kind of stumbled on it. I'm just, uh, uh, nothing's happened since uh, the day I recorded last week's episode. I, I hoped to have that video out last Wednesday. And now the hope is to have it out this Wednesday. I'm not sure what's going on there. Sometimes I do that. You know, it, it reminds me because yesterday, as I record this, I'm recording this Monday night. So yesterday would be Sunday. Woke up uh, to a very raging thunderstorm, which uh, made the electricity flicker a few times and killed our modem. So I spent the entire day yesterday with no internet which isn't exactly true because I still had my cellular data on my phone and so was able to access the internet that way. And at one point I put out a tweet explaining what was going on, that I, I had no internet. And I, I said, uh, so please entertain me, ask me anything. Eric, in his infinite wisdom and kindness, was the only one to step up to the plate yesterday 
And he asked me simply, how do you manage your time to be able to do all the stuff you do? I can just barely release a few episodes a month. And I fired back what I feel looking back at it as a, a very cocky response. Uh, you know, I'm very, I was very much like, oh, I have no life. It's just as simple as that. I spend my evenings and weekends recording and editing. And whenever I can, I try to record and bank episodes to be used during weeks that stuff actually comes up and I don't have a lot of time or what I just want a week off. The key really is to try to get ahead of the game. And I just, I'm not going to read everything, but I just look back at that and I, I thought, wow, look at you acting like you know what you're talking about. Like you, you have it all figured out. Because cause here's the thing, Eric, if you're listening, I don't have it all figured out. Yeah, that's the idea, but I don't always accomplish it. And then various things in my podcasting world, I guess you could say various things suffer, which is why I haven't put out an episode of Event or Else in a month or so, and which is why my George Perez tribute video that I started last week is not done yet. Uh, but I hope to have that done soon. Will it be done soon? Well. Hope Springs Eternal. All right, so we are here to talk about The Heckler. This was a book that only lasted six issues. It was published by DC Comics. It started in 92, ended in 93, depending on, I mean, it's got the, the, the first issue has a cover date of September of 92, and so depending on when it actually landed, you know, when it actually hit the shelves, I, I don't know if it's still stretched into 93 or not. Math is involved and, and I don't like to do stuff like that. But the character was created by Keith Giffen and the six issues uh, were plotted and penciled by Keith Giffen, scripted by Tom and Mary Beerbaum. Malcolm Jones III did inks for issues one through four. Bob Lewis did the inks. For issue number five, Steve Mitchell did the inks. For issue number six, Tom McCraw did colors on all six issues, and the letters for all six issues were done by Bob Pinaha. Now, this is a book that I remember just kind of, I don't know if, I, I really don't know where I picked this book up at. I, I have to assume that I was in the comic book store and it was on the shelf. And I thought it looked interesting because I would have been working at a comic book store at the time. And so, I mean, as long as the store ordered the books, I saw pretty much everything that came out. But I know that I bought all six issues because I dug them out of my collection. You can't get them digitally. They, they haven't digitized them at this point. It's one of those uh, long forgotten titles that DC has yet to get around to digitizing and putting on their, their app. Um, there are a couple of those like that. Uh, the Ray is another one from, I think that's also from the 90s. It was uh, Joe Casada art, and I feel like it was one of the first books that Joe Casada was on. And I want to say it was a four-issue mini. I've got it up, up there in the attic as well. I've been meaning to go dig it out because there are certain books like that and The Heckler uh, and Comet Man, if you remember Comet Man from Marvel Comics back in the late 80s, that was, I think that was also a six issue series that had uh, covers by Bill Sienkiewicz that I, I really remember enjoying, but they apparently didn't make too big of a mark back then because neither of the big two have digitized any of those, those, those series. So went up and dug out the heckler and, and gave it another read through and and it is a it's a humor book. And I remember it fondly and reading through it again, it it still held up for me. And after reading the six issues, I, I jumped on to uh, the Wikipedia just to get some information, you know, make sure I had whatever information might be out there about this book before I, I, I came here on the episode to talk about it. And here's a few things that I've learned. Thanks to the Wikipedia. Keith Giffen created the character as a superhero Bugs Bunny. Apparently, he wanted to work on a Bugs Bunny comic book, and uh, DC uh, actually had the rights. They were publishing a Bugs Bunny book at the time, but he didn't think that DC would let him 
do a Bugs Bunny comic, or at least they wouldn't approve of what he would do to Bugs Bunny. So he came up with the heckler and he designed this costume, which is, I love the costume. It's, it's a costume that covers him head to toe. It's got yellow in it and white and some orange. There's a certain like around his shoulders and arms, the, the words ha 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 are all over the costume and on certain areas, like around his shoulders and his chest and his arms. The face mask, the, the entire mask is, is yellow with a, a great big giant white smiley face, like almost a, a toothy grin, but you can't see the teeth. It's, I just, I love the costume. I think that's what drew me to the book in the first place. And then, of course, Keith Giffen's art. He just has a, he, he's got an iconic style. I'll, I'll just say that. He's got an iconic style, and I'm, I'm a big fan of his art, especially around this time. I know that at some point he goes on to Image Comics, and he does a book called Trencher, which I also remember enjoying, and I also have up in the attic, and I'm going to have to dig out at some point. But I remember it being even more Keith Giffen than what the heckler is. It's like if, if you're familiar with Keith Giffen's art style, the, the, uh, the trencher book just takes it to a whole new level. Uh, but if you've read, for example, he did a uh, Dr. Fate miniseries, I think in the 80s, uh, might have even been, was it post-crisis? I, I, don't, I don't know now off the top of my head. That actually is on the, the, the DC app, if you have it, the, the uh, Dr. Fate mini that Giffen draws. Anyway, he plotted and he penciled this book. And uh, he apparently told the beer bombs that even though the heckler costume features, you know, the ha 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 all over it in, in various areas that the, the heckler should never actually say ha ha. It shouldn't be part of his shtick because that was something that the creeper always did. So you never see or hear the heckler saying ha 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 anywhere within the comic. Um, apparently there was an issue seven that was solicited, but Humor comics, I guess at this time, were not all that popular. And after Giffen learned that the sales weren't doing so good, he went ahead and asked DC to go ahead and cancel the series and leave issue number six as the final issue. And so it does it does end and it actually ends by way of it. It tells you that it, it, it ended because of the sales. Um, each issue is its own standalone story, but it. it it uh, features most of the same characters. The main character, the heckler, his uh, his name is Stuart or Stu Mosley. He is the proprietor and owner of a diner in this fictional city of Delta City. The diner is called Eats, but there is this running gag throughout all six issues. It doesn't get rectified until the end of issue six, but the sign outside of Eats is never correct. And again, it's a, it's a running gag where the first time you see the sign, it says fats and Stu is on the phone with the company that made the sign and he's complaining and, you know, no, it's eats E A T S. You gave me a sign that says fats. And, and you see this a few times throughout the six issues where uh, we see the outside of the diner and it's a different sign um, until it culminates to issue six, which features what might possibly be the end of the world. And that's when they finally get the sign right. And it's it's a really great moment. I, I'm going to skip around as I talk about this series, because again, each issue is kind of a standalone. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm sure I'm going to spoil a lot of stuff, but it's just the way it is. But uh, with the exception of the opening splash page of each issue, the rest of all of the pages in each issue are set up as nine panel grids, every single page. And the, the, the page from issue six in which we finally see that the sign outside of eats actually says eats those entire nine panels. It's all the, the, this, there's a whole conversation that we, that we hear, but we're only seeing the outside of the diner. And so we're seeing word balloons coming from within the diner. We can't see anybody who's doing the talking, but we know who it is based on what they're talking about. One of the characters is a guy named Francois. He is the cook who works at Eats. 
He's a bit of an artist. He uh, he creates meals that are, I don't know how to explain them. He, he basically crafts sculptures and whatnot uh, out of his, his, his meals. It's, it's, they're, they're pretty funny, but he's, he's basically, he's talking to the, to the guy that works at the store, the, the, the place that made the signs and he's telling him, you know, thank He's thanking him that they've, they finally got the sign right. And then the guy from the, the sign shop is like, okay, well now you owe me for 31 signs. And Francois is like, what do you know? We, we, we ordered one sign. We have paid you for one sign. And the guy says, yeah, but we, we made 31 signs. So, you know, we made fats and teats was one of them. There was a whole list of all these different misspellings of the word eats. And the uh, the sign shop guy wanted Francois to pay for all of them, even though they were the ones that made a mistake each and every time. Uh, it was it was it's a great page. It's a great page because really, in essence, there's nothing going on. There's nothing to see on that page. It's all from the outside of the of the diner. But the the conversation is so funny because while this is going on, while they're arguing about this, somebody else unseen barges into the restaurant and informs Francois that they're being uh, evicted and that the whole town is being evacuated and they are being evic- evicted and they're they're taking all their stuff. And it's just it's really funny. It's some funny stuff. But let me kind of go through some of the characters in this book. There's Ledge. Well, actually, let me let me talk about Stu real quick, Stuart Mosley. Um, so he's he's the heckler, and he's kind of a he's kind of an awkward dude. When I when I read his dialogue, he he stutters slightly. He's got kind of a slight stutter, not not really pronounced, but he tends to pause. And uh if you've ever seen Newhart or the Bob Newhart show, or have ever seen any Bob Newhart stand up. That's his, the way he talks. That's how I, that's how I read Stu, the way he talks. And that's kind of his personality. He's just this kind of awkward, awkward kind of guy. He's a bit anal because there's the, there's kind of another plot point where there's a, 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 like a coffee shop, maybe there's a, or a newsstand where Stu uh, shows up at the newsstand at 6 a.m. on the dot every single morning. You know, they can, they can set their watches by it. And in fact, in the first issue, somebody is is at the newsstand and they say that it's 610. And the 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 woman who runs the newsstand, she's like, no, Stu hasn't arrived yet. It's it's not 610. Your watch is wrong. And turns out, yeah, the guy's watch is wrong. And so when he puts on the heckler costume, he just turns into he's he's basically Bugs Bunny. Think of like the way Bugs Bunny was in 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 many of the older, like the original, the 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 first couple of years of Bugs Bunny, just the way he would smart mouth people and irritate people, and you know when when he would go up against like an Elmer Fudd or or just a bad guy in general, Bugs Bunny didn't so much take them out using any kind of physical prowess. It was all mental irritation and humor that he would drive them. Uh, basically to the point of rage and he would, he would triumph that way. And that's kind of what the heckler does. He doesn't seem to employ any kind of superpowers uh, except for the fact that he must be invulnerable to a certain extent because he never seems to get hurt. It's got kind of that cartoon type violence in, in this book. Um, It's, you know, I remember, Reading it, you know, originally, I, I had no idea that Keith Giffen had created this character as a superhero Bugs Bunny. Knowing that now and then looking back at it now, it's totally, that's totally what it is. You can't help but think of the Looney Tunes when you're reading this book, knowing that that is what Keith Giffen was going for. And in fact, one of the issues is, uh, think about these, these uh, you know, Every once in a while, you'd get the kind of Looney Tunes episode in which somebody is trying to take out Bugs Bunny, right? Be it uh, Elmer Fudd or Yosemite Sam or some other character. And Bugs Bunny is just trying to go like from his home to the grocery store, basically, right? Or he's he, he's going somewhere. He's got a map. He's trying to get from one place to the other. He he His entire focus throughout the entire short 
is getting from the one place to the other. He's not paying attention to anything that's going on around him. But the entire time that he's studying the map and moving through the forest or whatnot, Elmer Fudd or whomever is setting up these elaborate traps to try and capture and kill Bugs Bunny. And they always backfire and they take out whoever it is, Yosemite Sam or, or, or Elmer or, or whoever. And so the whole time, Bugs Bunny is, is doing nothing and has no idea that any of this is going on around him. He's just simply trying to get where he needs to be. Well, they do an issue like that. One, I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head, but he, uh, because they, they set up kind of this, uh, this bad guy who runs the town, Boss Glitter, who is a, he wears like elaborate masks and frilly clothes. And, and uh, um, I mean, I, I'm not really sure how to describe the guy. Think of, think of like, uh, think of like those, like those uh, theater masks, you know, or, or like old uh, gothic, you know, comedy and drama masks that people would wear like on a stick and they'd have a little teardrop coming out of the eye and, and, and stuff like that. And he wears a lot of, uh, you know, pink ruffs and, and, uh, fur coats and that kind of stuff. And anyway, he's the, he's the mob boss basically. And he has various cronies that work for him. And one of them, for example, the very first issue, one of the, the cronies that worked for him is a guy called El Gusano, which is, uh, Spanish for the worm. And it was basically a big giant humanoid earthworm looking dude. He didn't have, uh, a, a, a face, at all. And he burrowed through the ground and, and he tries to take out the heckler and the the heckler ends up taking him out instead and getting, sending him to jail. And well, at one point there is an episode, an episode, an issue where a character by the name of Bushwhacker and the, the whacker is W A C K apostrophe R. So like Bushwhacker, he is basically he is like the, the wily e. coyote the the elmer fudd he he uh boss glitter is bemoaning the loss of el gasano of uh i think there was a char- a character we never met called king mambo or somebody like that that the heckler took out uh before the these stories even began and so bushwhacker who is some type of bounty hunter tells uh, Boss Glitter that he's going to take out the heckler. And so this entire issue is the heckler is going out on patrol. He's got this guy that kind of works for him named Ledge. He's kind of the, 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 the guy in the chair, right? He's the guy that, that gets the information and feeds it to, to the heckler. And he suggests to the heckler that he goes out on patrol, which he's never done before. So he's got a map. And he's trying to patrol the city to, to, to find evildoers. And as he's doing this, Bushwhacker is uh, attempting to kill him using these elaborate weapons and traps. And they all backfire. And it's, it's really kind of funny. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, there's, there's a panel in the issue in which a biography of, of Chuck Jones is present. But some of the villains that we see in the in this series, some of them that stand out to me, there's a guy named John Doe, the generic man. I think this is issue number two. He's literally, he's pink. He has no discerning features at all. He's he's literally just the shape of a person. He's solid pink or or skin tone, maybe you could say. And instead of a face, there are words to describe if he's sad, his face says sad. If he's surprised, his face says surprised. If he's, you know, is if he's wearing a jacket, it'll be just a, a solid white outline and it'll say jacket. It's he's a generic thug and he has this power that whenever he touches something, it turns into something that's generic as well. And so that's a bad guy that that he has to go up against uh, the cosmic clown, which was some type of robot from outer space, some kind of like assassin robot that is designed to look like a clown for some reason. Um, a strange theatrical scarecrow dude that uh, takes over a theater that likes to sing and dance. There are the four mopeds of the apocalypse who are like basically the, the, the sidekicks of the four horsemen. And they're called famine lass plague boy 
kid pestilence and then death is his, his, that that moped of the apocalypse his name is just Skippy and <laughs> they appear in issue 5 and they actually bring forth some kind of strange blobular weird floating god from this nether world and and that leads into issue number 6 which leads into the whole possible end of the world um there's a character by the name of the minx who is kind of like the punisher i guess but she's more of a bounty hunter uh but she tends to go after guys that are criminals but she uh had dated them at one point and so she keeps these dossiers on them which include why you know what they did on the date you know why their dates uh were terrible um it's it's a wonderfully funny 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 book and uh if you if you have a chance to track it down in the back issue bins if you enjoy Keith Giffen's humor uh again he plotted it but he didn't script it so i'm assuming most of the jokes most of the uh you know the back and forth between characters the really funny conversations um are all written by the beer bombs that 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 you know i don't know how involved giffen was in regard to a lot of that i don't know it just said that it, the the books were plotted and penciled by him so i don't know how intricate the plots were i don't i don't know but it is very funny and again if you can find them in the back issue bins i can't imagine they would be too expensive. I'll tell you what, let me go to, let me go to mycomicshop.com. This isn't the, the be all end all of, you know, how much books cost. But when I was selling a few books online, this is one of the places I would go to get an idea of maybe where I should start when it came to pricing books. And again, despite what this website may have them priced as, uh, your local comic shop, if they've got them, may have them priced completely differently. But uh, it looks like they're averaging about two bucks a copy here. So yeah, six issues. They're they're beautiful looking. They're very funny. Uh, again, you have to be into both Keith Giffen art and Keith Giffen humor to enjoy these books. But if if those are two things you like and you've never read The Heckler, then I I suggest adding that to the list of books that you look for when you're out there rummaging through back issue bins. Six issues, 92 through 93 DC Comics. Very, very funny stuff. And there you go. That's another episode coming to a close. So with that in mind, tell all your friends about us. Get out there. Just tell them, hey, have you heard of Just Another Fanboy? It's pretty awesome. You should listen. Share the episode out there on the Twitters, go out there on the Facebooks, the MySpaces, the Squarespace, the whatever, I don't know. That's a stupid joke. I'm aware. I won't make that joke again. But if you're out there on the social media and you see, for example, that I have tweeted about this episode, retweet it, share it with people. Maybe do a quote tweet and tell people why they should listen to the episode. Tell folks on Facebook, just get out there in all those places. You can rate and review the show and all them regular apps where you can rate and review the show. That's always a big help. You can also subscribe to the Steven Says Stuff newsletter so that you can get the the episodes just emailed directly to your inbox. And of course, you know, support me over there on the Patreon. Dollar a month. uh, As often as possible, you're going to get at these episodes before anybody else. You'll always get my other podcast a week before everybody else. And as often as I can do it, you'll get all my other episodes earlier than everybody else. So far, I've only been getting the night before on a lot of these, but one of the things I hope to try to do during that month that I take off there in June is to get myself uh, ahead a little bit. You know, I would like to be able to put just another fanboy on the same schedule as my other podcast so that the folks on the Patreon get it a week before everybody else to make that, you know, to make the the support that you guys and girls provide to me, you know, worth it. Not that, you know, supporting me isn't worth it. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say, folks. Anyway, the links to all that stuff will be right there on the show notes. So make sure you join me back here on Thursday for another JAF Classics episode. This is going to be episode number 20. 
in which the debut of 30 Seconds of Nonsense appears in the first time ever doing a, a segment called 30 Seconds of Nonsense was was in that episode from back in January of 2007. And uh, you also get to hear me cry in that episode. It's not real crying. It's it's fake crying. But you 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 get to hear my acting chops, a bit of drama, folks. And as you listen, it may bring a tear to your eye as well. Again, that's going to be on Thursday, folks. Until then, my name is Steven, and I'm just another fanboy. Be nice to each other. Bye-bye, Daddy. Bye-bye, Daddy. Good job. Uh-oh. You're fine.